and welcome into Poke the Bear episode 90. 90, Connor. There is no 90, correct? I'm right on this. No 90 in Bruins history, or am I forgetting someone? Marcus Johansson. Oh, my God. How could I forget JoJo? The great JoJo. What a yes. terrible start. Yes, the Marcus Johansson episode. Wow, I can't believe I forgot that. I know 91, obviously, but yes. I just escaped my memory. Run, we're starting to run out, though. So Yes, it's coming quick. I know we get into the triple digits, but uh, I'm Evan Marinovsky. That is Connor Ryan. Connor, what is up? Evan, doing well. How you doing? Doing great. Doing great. We're recording this on the day of the Frozen Four. Uh, big uh, games, technically last night when people will be listening to this. Uh, do we have? Pre- do you have predictions? We can measure this up. We can do it like we did the national championship on Monday. Do you have any predictions? Because I have mine. I'm curious what yours are. Um. <sighs> I'll go with Mankato. I think they've probably been the best team all year, so I think that's the safest pick. Uh, Michigan's got the star power, but I don't know. I'm just feeling like – I feel like this is a year where you need just, like, a team like Mankato that's got guys, like, you know, uh, a veteran leadership, like guys that have bought in, like a school like that's going to break through this year. 100%. I have Minnesota State beating Michigan uh, – excuse me. I have, I have Denver beating Michigan Thursday night. I'll say 4-3. Mm-hmm. to three. Then I have Minnesota State beating Minnesota four to one. And then in the final, I have Minnesota State beating Denver three to two. It'll be close and low. And how soon, uh, how soon after that does Johnny Beecher sign with the Bruins? Does he not leave? Does he not leave? See, I think the the move he should make is transfer to a different school and play his senior year there. That's what I think he should do. Um, And like actually play top line minutes. Granted, a lot of people are going to be leaving Michigan, right? You're going to have a plethora of guys out the door if whenever the day after whenever they they have their final game right um but for me and granted maybe he could go and join their top six and become a mainstay on the power play and all that stuff but they have a lot of good recruits coming in and those guys are gonna be taking up those spots and so for me personally if i'm johnny beecher i transfer to a different really good school with top six time and penalty kill and power play time where you can more kind of round out your game, kind of like a UMass, but that, I, that, that's too big of a pipe dream. Um, but that is what I think will happen, but yeah, he might sign. I wouldn't be, it would not surprise me in the slightest. If he just said, screw it, I'm going to Providence. Um, but anyways, uh, there's things going on with the hometown Boston Bruins, the guys who are currently there. Uh, and the one thing starting to happen is the injuries are piling up a bit, which is never something you want to see, especially in the last month of the regular season. And you have Hampus Lindholm going down on Tuesday night. That, again, sounded bad. But again, uh, I think Hags said he walked right past him. So I think he should be okay. Um, But not exactly the greatest time for these injuries to start piling up, right? No, not not at all. I mean, you look at the fact that we knew – as soon as the schedule got announced back in whatever it was, July, August, that it was going to be a sprint to the finish line of the regular season, which is never good. You never want to have guys completely taxed uh, going into, you know, leading into the the playoffs. So when you've got Lindholm who goes down with an injury, Pasternak has been dealing with whatever that core injury is that definitely sprouted up again. Um, you don't want to see happen to your best goal scorer, even a guy like Frederick, which is really unfortunate because he's been playing his best hockey and he's been a key cog on that third line. Um, it, it's, it's tough to see, especially when this should be the time of the year where, you know, you've got guys in place other than maybe that decor, where you got to figure out where those pieces fall. You have the, the makings of a very solid, especially top three lines there where I don't think you really had to tinker with them all that much, whether it be, DeBrusque fitting in well and cashing in on chances on the first line. You had Frederick and uh, Smith and Coyle working well. And again, we've talked about it before, but Hall has been fantastic in the middle of, of Hall and Pasternak. So everything's been working out. The one thing that could have derailed it is injuries. And now when you've got this stretch here where I think it's 16 games in 32, 31 days, I mean, oh. <laughs> and again, it's not just the fact just the pure workload. Like they could be playing the Detroit Red Wings during that stretch all the time. They'd probably still lose a couple of games as you saw on Tuesday night, but it's not just that, but you've got tough matchups up ahead. You know, you've got Tampa Bay, you've got Washington, you've got Toronto a couple of times. And it's not like in years past where the Bruins are pretty much sitting, you know, in first or second place in the Atlantic. If you opt right now to kind of rest and see what happens, you could very well, 
maybe be healthy, but you're staring at a wild card spot uh, in a first round matchup against Carolina and Florida. So you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place in terms of what's kind of the next step moving forward. And who knows, maybe again, the Bruins practice, we're recording this on Thursday. They're practicing a little bit later over at Tampa Bay. We could find out that Bostonok's fine, Frederick's fine, and Lindholm's doing well. Maybe miss a game or two, who knows? Or, I mean, who knows? Maybe it's an MCL thing for Lind- Like, you hope it's not the case, but um, you're kind of in this state of limbo right now, not just with the current state of your lineup for how you're going to tackle these next couple of games against uh, potential playoff opponents, but also just what's kind of the best course to take moving forward over the final weeks of the regular season. Yeah, Pasternak's thing seems like it's a nagging injury because we've seen it a few times this year with his with a with it kind of like in his core. So again, like that's something you do worry about with the playoffs when it's like that's not like he sprained something or he broke something that's kind of easily fixable. It's more like you know that's something that could keep coming up, kind of like Patrice Bergeron's groin, uh, that injury that kept coming year after year after year, and it begs the question, and it's a big question. It's one that every team faces at the end of seasons what is more important rest or playoff positioning and to me normally you might say playoff positioning right but in this case and we and you said this on Bruins beat they're not a favorite in any of these series right there's no series where it's like that's a win even Toronto right like Toronto obviously in the past and we like to make fun of them but like we know that'd be a a difficult series still just might be the easiest of the three or four potential ones that they could have um but it's hard to pick a spot. So maybe the right move with these injuries is you go with the rest. Yeah, no, I agree. I, and it's tough because we say this now and then all of a sudden they get steamrolled by Carolina, <laughs> Florida, right? And you look at it, you know, again, you can say that all you want. Yeah, exactly. So at what end does that help you when you're, you're putting yourself in a tough spot? But no, I think you hit the nail on the head that whoever they face in the first round is going to be an uphill battle. Even a team who they probably have played the best against this year in Tampa Bay, you could convince me that argument that, you know, maybe they're, that's their best matchup, but I don't know. Tampa Bay is still Tampa Bay. And until you beat them, until some other team beats them, I'm still operating with the assumption. This is still the, the season crew that has won two cups in a row and has the personnel to, to grind out over a seven game series. So um, yeah, you're kind of damned if you do damned if you don't in this situation. But I think when you look at what could go wrong, do you, not hop so much on playoff position and, and then go into the playoffs healthy and you roll your, you know, you roll the die and see what the chances are, or do you desperately try to get an easier matchup against Toronto or Tampa Bay <laughs> with Postnock, you know, out of commission or Lindholm hurt or who knows another guy, like we're, you know, you keep on playing these games, even if this lineup was healthy and the Bruins were still fighting for playoff positioning, I have to imagine they were envisioning giving a guy like Patrice Berger on some days off here down the stretch. Like you don't want to be going full steam ahead. And all of a sudden a guy like Berger with his groin that acts up or, or something like that. Um, when it comes to spelling out what's going to, you know, be the, the catalyst that ends this playoff run that they go on this year, you're really, uh, you know, bolstering your chances of leaving, uh, leaving the cup run early. If, you got multiple guys out with injuries or guys that are completely out of gas by the time we get to May. You could be playing the Red Wings in the first round. And if you have injured guys, you're, you're, you're going to have a tough time. So I think injured guys uh, resting is sort of the smart move there. The other thing, what happened to the Red Wings catching up to the Bruins? Remember all that talk during like November, December, like, oh, Red Wings. They're, they're <laughs> making a run. And then they're they making a run. Up, they gave up like seven goals per game over like a, a three week stretch. And like, all right, yeah, we're done. We're good. Done, done here. Um, back to the Bruins, uh, speaking of someone who is sort of losing a little bit of that, you know, the hot streak that he was on Jeremy Swayman, uh, has sort of struggled of late, uh, or not looked himself, you know, even the wins, it's not looking terrific, uh, not happening at a great time. Is this something, what level of concern do you have in this? Uh, what, what's like the rating? Like DEFCON one is the highest. I'll do like DEFCON like three. Because it's something I was thinking I, a simple one to 10 scale, 10 being like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. One being no big deal. I was thinking more of that, but DEF CON three works. Let's go, let's go, let's go six. Oh, okay, then. six. All right. Okay. Uh, because that is it surprising that a rookie goalie who's now kind of getting into uncharted territory in terms of his reps is kind of hitting a bit of a wall? No, it's all about just kind of how he responds off of it. And I think one thing that even though this has been a trend, it's also you haven't seen a stretch where 
I think poor games have kind of snowballed for him, right? Where it's like he's got a, a game where he has like a 780 save percentage the next day. It's yeah. like eight, the next one's 808 or something like that. You know, it's technically um, an improvement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you focus on the positives of it. But, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where I don't think it's he's hit a complete rut in that regard. Again, you'd like to be a lot more stable. I think it's what, like an 883 save percentage over his last eight games. Um, hmm. And I, I think it's a a situation where one you have to imagine he's hitting a bit of a wall here um but also it's the natural hurdle that i think most young goalies deal with in terms of just teams getting the book out on you i think um some of it's stuff that obviously he can control in terms of you know rebound control which was a little shaky to stop the air then he really tightened it up during that kind of post ras keter he went on um and then he's kind of struggled with it a, b- a bit more but you also look at um stuff you know moving laterally he's had some trouble with uh, like wraparound chances where he's bit on a few of those um you know uh handling the puck those kind of things have spread up quite a bit and it seems like teams are now like all right we know kind of how to get him moving how to get him off his game a little bit and so for him it's again it's a challenge that all goalies face in terms of adjusting to that knowing that teams have the book out on you over the span of a whole season and kind of fighting through it and at least the Bruins again i as much as people talk about the old Mark signing and whether it was a waste to have this guy and he's the $5 million backup, this is why you get, have a guy like him in there. Um, you know, has he been spectacular? No, even though it's funny, like you, you look at his last couple of games, he's got an old Mark's got a nine, three, one save percentage his last six games. It doesn't really feel like it. No, but like, but again, the stats are the stats in that regard. So he's at least giving you winning hockey and he's a guy that can slot in there. So if he can, you know, handle a little bit of a heavier workload here over the next week or two, and Omar uh, Swayman has the opportunity to kind of just work on his game off the ice, outside of a high stake situation, like I, that's the risk you run with with a guy like Swayman who's trying to find his game again. Like you don't want him to all of a sudden go into a, a matchup against Tampa or Washington and get lit up, right? Because he's, you know, hitting a bit of a rut here and then it kind of snowballs for him. So we'll see what happens with the Bruins in terms of who they go with for this game against uh, Tampa Bay on Friday. It'll be interesting just to see what the the rationale is there in terms of who Cassidy goes with. But um, I imagine over the next couple of weeks, you're still going to see a lot more of Olmark as Swayman, who I think is their guy if you go into the playoffs. Uh, it gives him a bit more time to kind of work on his game and iron out some of those details that have kind of been straying away from him as of late. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with Olmark again, like, as you said, like, it's why you have him. That's what the point of it. Like he can handle a full um, season and he can, uh, he's been through something similar, at least through at least a full season. Uh, Swayman has not. So again, like that's why you got Olmark. That's why you have him there. I'm not super worried about Swayman, but as you said, like, again, if, it continues to snowball over these next few weeks. Then you're kind of going towards round one and you're like, okay, well, is Swayman really the guy you want to go with? Maybe, maybe it's a case of like start Olmark in the playoffs, let him do his thing and then let that motivate Swayman. Cause remember, I mean, Swayman went on that heater after he got kind of replaced by Rask. So maybe you kind of play with the kid's head a bit. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe I should be the coach. I mean, it's a crazy, a crazy move right there. But yeah, uh, really playing chess. Well, they're, they're all playing checkers. Uh, but no, I, that, that's going to become more clear, I think, over the next few weeks. Still have a, a little while to the playoffs, which is weird because the Celtics are like Ready pretty much there. And they're in the almost like right there. And the Bruins still have quite a bit of time um, until then. One other thing that has to get solidified before uh, the playoffs begin. Who is on the third D pair? And we and, and you've been saying Riley Forbert, Riley Forbert. It makes a lot of sense. They did not look so hot in Detroit. <laughs> that was uh, a bad. No. That was a bad night for those two. Um, and some of those were not Swayman's fault either. That was just rough defense. And Mike Riley had a really tough game in Detroit. Is he someone you think who needs to be playing all the time to let him play through these things, or does he need to kind of watch from nine a little bit more? I mean, I kind of view it in the same way. I think we talked a few weeks ago about Brennan Kahlo and whether he like deserves time to sit. I think it, that's one of those situations where I don't know if it helps his confidence to keep on sitting him. Cause I, I still think he's like a potential everyday, everyday player. He's got the talent to impact this team, but it's also one thing where it's like, all right, Kahlo, he goes through his ups and downs. He has a couple of plays where you go like, Oh, but like Riley, it's one of those things where even though you have a few more weeks, of the regular season, how much more do you, can you sit and watch this deep here getting like hemmed in routinely? I mean, they've yeah. 
I looked at the, the numbers that Forbert and Riley together as a pairing have only been together for, I think it's like 38 minutes of five and five ice time. And the Bruins have been outscored five, nothing. Oh, that's really bad. That's really, like, that's really bad. Like, uh, that's one where, you know, you. you that's not even a full 60 at, minutes. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's one of those things where you try to view what's the best possible six man unit you have. And I still think Fulbert with his PK, you know, ability and just kind of his, his skills in that third pairing role and Riley with his offensive playmaking in that third pairing role and a bit more of a sheltered spot there on paper. It makes plenty of sense that that's how you maximize your defense, but can you afford to let them kind of sort through these things if the results are this bad right now, right? Like if they were just middling and they had some good, some bad, you work on it, let them, let them solve it. But if we go into this game against Tampa and that's your pairing and they get three goals scored against them, like how much more, how much more runway do you have with those guys? So, but then you weigh it against with like, is Clifton the, the better answer there? Is Josh Brown the better answer there? Who's, you know, what you're going to get from him, but is he the answer? I don't, like, I, I don't think so. I, I think people view Josh Brown as this guy that could, you know, draw into the lineup regularly. I kind of view him as just kind of like an upgraded Tenorti. Like he's yeah. a body there and you know what you're going to get from him. And if there's a game where it gets physical or maybe a game where the Bruins get knocked around in the series and the next game they bring in Tenorti, right? Like I, so, I kind of view it like that, uh, that Bruins Maple Leaf series, right? Where I think it was game one or two where DeBras got bowled over by Kadri. And I think the next game back yes. came in. Yeah. Right? And, and they were a lot more this. physical. So like that, I think that's where a guy like Josh Brown uh, kind of figures into the equation, not as a, we're going to scratch Riley Fulbert and put him in um, for just the sake of production wise. Um, but it's tough because the, the rationale is there and on paper it makes sense that Fulbert and Riley gives you your best bet, but not when they're getting <laughs> ripped apart every single time they're on the ice there. So I don't know whether it's you then look at breaking up that second pair and maybe one of those guys goes with Grizzly, like one goes with Kahlo, but then you're – are you messing up their, you know, their ability and, and Carlo's already still kind of finding his game. So it's tough. Like as much as that forward, that forward core seems like it's all set, health wise, uh, you know, barring health, that decor has got a lot of questions that need to be answered still. As you said, and on paper, that makes so much sense. Uh, the only thing that doesn't make sense about them is they're both left shots, right? Like yeah. that's the only thing. And so it is kind of a weird thing where it's like, how's this not working? I wonder what Bruce Cassidy's nerds upstairs are saying about that. Pairing. Yes. You know, I wonder what they're, what are they saying um, about that pairing? Cause uh, it'd be very interesting to see again. Cause like with, as you said, with Clifton, like, Maybe you catch Clifton, like 2019 playoffs, Connor Clifton, where it's just great chaos. Yeah. Or you get like all the other time Clifton, which is can sometimes the be kind Toronto, of the Toronto Clifton. Yes. Where, yeah. You know, like yeah. it's, that's the risk you run. Exactly. So it is a little bit of a, it's a big risk and you got to kind of figure out what your third pairing is. You wonder if they maybe should have done a bit more uh, getting help uh, for that third pairing at the deadline with this kind of being the way it is, that's something we really can't, I guess, uh, talk in depth about or understand until the playoffs come and go. Cause then you can say, okay, they really should have went out and made a push for a Josh Manson or a Justin Braun or someone like that. Uh, but they did get uh, Josh Brown who again, like, isn't going to sell jerseys. Actually, he might in his first shift. He got a fight. He, he punched, so. Yeah. He got, he punched the guy in his first game. So he's that's yeah, a good he's way a, to ingratiate yourself to the crowd. They'll be chanting his name soon enough. Uh, speaking of uh, things that are coming soon enough, what can people look forward from you over at Boston Sports Journal? Yeah, we'll have our usual uh, daily coverage in terms of game reports, columns, breakdowns, uh, all that stuff over at BSJ as we get ready for the playoffs. Um, we have a few features we're still working on that we hope to roll out before the, uh, the end of the regular season, before the playoff grind really begins. Um, so all that stuff will be over at BSJ. So please subscribe over at bostonsportsjournal.com. Want to follow me on Twitter? You can do that at Connor Ryan underscore 93. Go do all that. That's Connor Ryan. I'm Evan Marinovsky. You Poke the Bear listeners have a terrific rest of your week.